This is a tale of two legacies. This is a tale of a passing of the torch. And this is a tale of the fans taking matters into their own hands. This is Final Fantasy V. It turns 30 this year. My name's Zio, and I'll be your lore keeper. Our tale begins in 1990. The Japanese RPG Gold Rush was still in full force. Heavy hitters like Final Fantasy III and Dragon Quest IV led the charge that year alongside Sega's Fantasy Star III. Meanwhile in the West, Dragon Quest I and II were brought over under the name Dragon Warrior. This was also the year that Western fans would get their hands on the original Final Fantasy published by Nintendo. With FF3 out the door, Square was hard at work on Final Fantasy IV for the Famicom alongside Final Fantasy V for the Super Famicom to be released in the summer of 1991. A Super Final Fantasy. But the seven-year-old Famicom was long in the tooth by this point, and development of FF4 was shifted over to the Super Famicom and released in 1991, while FF5 was released the following year. The core team from the previous games was mostly intact, Hironobu Sakaguchi reprised his role as director one more time before his promotion to executive vice president. This was his favorite in the series until the release of Final Fantasy IX. Sakaguchi wrote the story alongside Yoshinori Kitase. This would be the first time the two men worked together. Sakaguchi and Kitase worked on the game's story in a relay, checking each other's work to ensure continuity. The two men had very distinct writing styles. Sakaguchi's style was centered around drama, whereas Kitase excelled at writing events that played out in spectacular fashion. Kitase studied screenwriting and filmmaking at Nihon University College of Art and joined Square in 1990 despite having no software development experience. Renowned artist Yoshitaka Amano reprised his role as series illustrator. A fledgling designer named Tetsuya Nomura designed the monsters. The in-game sprites were done by Kazuko Shibuya, who had been working at Square since 1986. The music was once again composed by series veteran Nobuo Uematsu, who by this time was used to the Super Famicom sound hardware. Uematsu developed ideas for the music while reading over the script and then creating titles for all the tracks. He then came up with melodies based on the titles and what was happening in the story. Uematsu figured the game needed upwards of 100 tracks, but ended up scaling that back to 56. The game's soundtrack was an eclectic mix of upbeat and somber tunes, along with exciting battle themes. When players first start the game, they're greeted by a short credit roll accompanied by the main theme, Ahead on Our Way. This lighthearted number conveys an air of adventure and wonder, and immediately sets the player up for the adventure that's in store for them. A two-disc album of the game's music was released by Square and NTT Publishing the day after the game's release. An arrangement album called Final Fantasy V Dear Friends was released in March of the following year. A piano collection was also released in June of that year. And of course, there's been no shortage of covers for the game's music, with Battle on the Big Bridge being a fan favorite. The team had twice as much memory to work with as before, which afforded them much more creative freedom. The environments were more colorful and detailed than before, cutscenes were more dramatic, and battle effects were more impactful. Even with this newfound freedom, they still had to take the utmost care as they were still pushing the envelope with their available resources. It's no secret that Final Fantasy IV revolutionized the RPG genre. Final Fantasy V, on the other hand, was perhaps more about evolution than revolution. It took gameplay elements from previous entries and greatly expanded on them. The job system from FF3 would return, but FF5 took this up a few notches. Each party member started off as a freelancer and more jobs became available as players made their way through the game. Final Fantasy III penalized players for switching jobs too often, but here, they could switch as often as they wanted with impunity. Each job had its own set of abilities that became available as players won battles, and these abilities could be used on other jobs. Mastering a job awarded players extra perks as a freelancer. Staple jobs like Black Mages, White Mages, and Monks make their return here in addition to some new ones. Samurai, Dancers, and Beastmasters make their first appearance here. 
This was also the debut of another fan favorite job, the Blue Mage. The idea for the Blue Mage actually came from one of the members of the FF4 team who thought it would be cool to let players use abilities from monsters. The job system gave battles much more depth than before as it afforded players much more freedom and flexibility. Players who understood the nuances of combat can easily take down some of the game's most challenging bosses. The Freelancer was also one of the strongest jobs in the game if players were diligent about mastering the other jobs. On the other side of that coin, players who knew their way around the game could forego the job system altogether. In fact, someone at Square actually did this during playtesting. Final Fantasy V's job system has left its mark on countless other RPGs throughout the years, including one that we cover rather extensively on this channel. The active time battle system also made a comeback, but this time each character had a bar that filled up to indicate when it was their turn to make a move. This added yet another layer of strategy and nuance to battles. The speed at which the bar filled up was determined by the character's agility plus the weight of their equipment. For example, a thief has high agility and wears light armor, meaning their ATB bar fills faster than their lower agility counterparts. When we come back, the world of Final Fantasy V and those who call it home. The world consists of two major continents and is maintained by the four elemental crystals, allowing its inhabitants to live a mostly peaceful existence. Commerce and communication are made possible through wind drakes and ships. The kingdoms of Tycoon, Walse, and Karnak are the three main powers in this world, each protecting a crystal that they believe is the source of their prosperity. The fourth crystal belongs to an ancient civilization that was buried deep underground. The crystals aren't as powerful as they were in ancient times, so special machines were built to amplify their powers. Unfortunately, these machines put great strain on them. Chocobos exist in this world, both in the flightless yellow and airworthy black variety. Multiple schools of magic exist in this world, including blue magic, which incorporates techniques from defeated enemies. There's also a second world with its own distinct geography from the first world. Once upon a time, these two worlds were one. The main party only consists of five characters, four of whom meet within the first hour. Bart's Clouser is an easygoing 20-year-old adventurer who hails from the town of Lix. He travels the world with his chocobo named Boko. His Japanese name is Butts, but since he's called Bart's everywhere else, we'll just stick with that. Bart's is somewhat dim-witted, often failing to grasp certain things, often to the amusement of his companions. His element is wind, representing passion. Bart's is also the only character that the player is allowed to rename. Bart's is the first character that we meet as he goes to investigate the meteorite that crashes near Tycoon. Lana Charlotte Tycoon is the kind-hearted 19-year-old princess of Tycoon. Lana is caring and altruistic, often to her own detriment. She has a special bond with her wind drake Hiryu, who is the last of his kind in this world. Her element is water, representing devotion. She meets Bart's after leaving the castle to investigate what happened to her father and the crystal. Ferris Schweres is a bold and determined 20-year-old pirate captain. She was raised by pirates from a young age after an accident at sea separated her from her family. Not wanting to be the only female in a crew of pirates, she dressed and behaved like a man and would eventually earn their respect. She forms a bond with a sea dragon named Seldra, who pulls their ship without the need for the wind. Ferris was initially planned to be a gambler named Eva Sherwell, but they made her a pirate to fit in better with the game's world. That idea would serve as the inspiration for Setzer in Final Fantasy VI. Her element is fire, representing courage. Ferris imprisons the others after they try to steal her ship, but ends up helping them after she sees that Lena has the same pendant as her. Galif Halm Baldesian is an irreverent, wisecracking 60-year-old who suffers from amnesia after his meteorite crash lands near Tycoon. His main task is stopping the crystals from breaking to prevent a major calamity. His element is Earth, representing hope. Galif meets the others after crash landing his meteorite near Tycoon, but unfortunately he's lost his memory. Kryal Meyer Baldesian is the light-hearted, animal-loving 14-year-old granddaughter of Galif. She appears early on, but Galif doesn't remember her as a result of his crash-induced amnesia. She's able to communicate with animals like chocobos, moogles, and even windrakes. She and Galif hail from the other world. Kryl has the same elemental representation as her grandpa. 
These five would be chosen as the Warriors of Light, whose main task is to defend the four elemental crystals. Failing this task would have dire ramifications for the world at large. These crystals served as a seal for a malevolent sorcerer named Exdeath, whom Galif and three other men fought 30 years prior. Of course, the task of eliminating Exdeath falls to Bart's generation. And while not a playable character, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this goofball, a certain popular breakout character. Gilgamesh grew up in a village of warriors. The Genji armor that he wears was passed down to its best warriors who proved their merit in combat. The armor is said to have gained its durability through centuries of blood, sweat, and dust. Gilgamesh would go on to appear in later Final Fantasy titles as both a summon and an optional boss. A four-part OVA called Final Fantasy Legend of the Crystals was released in 1994. In Japan, it was simply called Final Fantasy, though. This was the first Final Fantasy anime, as well as the first direct sequel in terms of story and setting. The animation was done by Japanese studio Madhouse, who would also work on Cardcaptor Sakura. Legend of the Crystals is set 200 years after the events of Final Fantasy V. The world is given the name Planet R, and the crystals are in danger once again. The story centers around a headstrong young man named Pretz and a young lady named Linnelly. They're joined by a Tycoon Air Force General named Valkus and a Sky Pirate Captain named Rouge. The OVA has received a mixed reception over the years. Some praised the animation and its balance of action, adventure, and humor. Others called it a lackluster and drawn-out retelling of Final Fantasy V, or even a cruel mockery of all Final Fantasy stands for. When we come back... How the world reacted to the original release of Final Fantasy V 30 years ago. And then you'll hear the tale of a localization in Limbo and the fans who took matters into their own hands. Final Fantasy V Super Fancon de Kohio Hatsbai Chu Square. On Sunday, December 6th, 1992, Final Fantasy V made its way onto store shelves in Japan on the Super Famicom. The game sold nearly a million copies within a day of its release, outselling even its predecessor on its first day. Final Fantasy V would end the year as the second best-selling game in Japan, just behind Dragon Quest V. Famitsu gave the game a respectable cross score of 34 out of 40, giving it high marks for its sound and visuals. The reviewers also praised the story for its emotional impact, even warning readers that there are some tearjerker moments. Famitsu also gave the game generous coverage in December of that year, devoting several pages to job ability and monster lists. They even conducted a poll of the top 100 games of all time in early 2006, FF5 took the number 15 spot, beating out even the original Super Mario Bros. Family Computer Magazine published several in-depth guidebooks on the game as well. Western fans, however, would be left in the lurch. In late 1991, Final Fantasy IV made it across the Pacific as Final Fantasy II. This was around the time that Square started publishing its own games without Nintendo's help. However, the original translation wasn't the greatest as Square had no localization department at the time. FF4 was translated by a woman who barely spoke any English. Members of Square's sales and finance team had to work overtime to clean up the translation. Final Fantasy II fell short of Square's sales expectations. They wanted a million units, but only ended up shipping around 250,000. In spite of this, RPG-hungry Western fans wanted more. This was around the time that Ted Woolsey joined Square after finishing his master's degree in Japanese literature. A typical project would have him flying out to Japan, where he would have around 30 days to translate a script based on the finished Japanese version of a game. During FF5's development, Woolsey met with Sakaguchi and other top brass at Square to discuss future projects. In response to sales figures in the West, Square felt the Western market wasn't ready for two flagship Final Fantasy titles in a row. They felt that Western gamers needed to be trained up on that style of game. To bolster awareness of Japanese RPGs in the West, work began on a Final Fantasy title aimed at American audiences dubbed Final Fantasy Mystic Quest, which was released in October of 1992 and in Japan and Europe the following year. Mystic Quest, however, ultimately missed the mark. 
Final Fantasy V was to be called Final Fantasy III in North America to fit with the numbering scheme established by the previous titles. Wolsey was almost finished with the translation when the project was scrapped. Final Fantasy V's gameplay was much more intricate than its predecessors thanks in no small part to the job system. Western gamers and focus groups felt it was too complex and inaccessible. Square would later announce that it would be released as a standalone title, but this project was also canned. Woolsey would go on to state that FF5 was one of his favorite projects from his time at Square and genuinely wanted to bring it to the West. But FF, FF5, I thought was just, you know, spine tingling. It's just, you know, with a sound of the wind and you know bells you know in the background and you know dragons to ride on and it, that was that was that was where i really got just hit deep into into these this style of rpg yeah i mean just the, the, the sheer fact of not being able to bring that one out here I, that's where i was worried about being met in a dark alley by someone who was pissed <laughs> off I, I would have understood being <laughs> legend for that because that that was a mistake we should have brought that out i thought but and i, I championed that idea Sometime in the mid-90s, rumors began circulating about another attempt at localization dubbed Final Fantasy Extreme, marketed towards the RPG-savvy crowd, but this too fell by the wayside. There was yet another supposed attempt to bring the game to Windows by third parties, one of which being IDOS Interactive, but none of these ever saw the light of day. But enough was enough, and certain fans were tired of waiting. The year was 1997, and the internet was still in its nascent years. Message boards, chat rooms, and news groups were abuzz with the latest news and rumors about new and upcoming games. This was the time when fans learned of games and even entire franchises that never left Japan. This was also the time when tech-savvy fans started taking matters into their own hands. If Square wasn't going to bring this game to Western fans, then the fans were going to do it themselves. Final Fantasy V was among the first games to receive a complete fan translation, but the road to a fully functional translation was a rocky one to say the least. One of the first to step up to the plate was an ambitious group of mostly teenagers calling themselves RPGE. Several other fan groups sprung up soon after, which led to countless other projects in the translation scene, but very few of these projects would actually make it across the finish line. This was still very much uncharted territory, and the work was done by amateurs, most of whom were teenagers at the time. There was no established best practice at the time, and there was little to no documentation on the actual hardware. These amateurs were essentially shooting their shot in the dark. RPGE's original process involved modifying the text files, directly translating chunks of the game from Japanese to English. There was one problem with this though. The dialogue boxes could only display so many characters at a time. This was perfectly fine for Japanese writing since it was much more compact than English. For example, a sentence written in Japanese would only take a handful of characters. Translating that sentence into coherent English, however, required far more letters, including spaces. The game essentially had to be reprogrammed to accommodate for the English language. This led to infighting between members of RPGE, two of whom would break off from the main group to work on their own FF5 project themselves. One person did the programming and reverse engineering work, while another person did the translation. An earlier patch was leaked in October of 1997, forcing the release of the mostly completed .96 patch. Final Fantasy VII had released the previous month, so Western fans were astonished to learn of a heretofore brand new Final Fantasy experience. On top of that, it was free. All they needed was a computer, the game file itself, and a special piece of software. Even though console emulation was still in its very early days, RPG-hungry fans naturally gobbled it up. The final version of the patch came out in June of 1998, making FF5 one of the first completed fan translation projects. RPGE would finish two more projects before disbanding near the turn of the century, but FF5 still remains their most notable work. Interestingly enough, many people who were involved in that scene back in the day would go on to have jobs in the game industry. While the original efforts may not have panned out, they were still an important stepping stone and proof of concept. The final product showed the rest of the community exactly what it took to bring their localization dreams to fruition. 
when we come back. A multi-million dollar game company is a day late and a dollar short, but they eventually get it right. In the late 90s, Square commissioned Tosei to port their 16-bit Final Fantasy titles to the PlayStation, adding a quick save feature and FMV sequences at the beginning and end of each game. Tose was founded in 1979 and became known as a ghost developer over the years. Whether you realize it or not, you've actually played several of their games. In September of 1999, Final Fantasy V received an official localization as part of the Final Fantasy Anthology alongside Final Fantasy VI. In Europe, however, it was released alongside Final Fantasy IV in 2002. Critics roasted the game for what they felt was a weak story coupled with its lackluster localization. They did, however, praise the game profusely for its job system. By all accounts, the anthology version was both a day late and a dollar short. This version suffered from lengthy load times in between battles. On top of that, the localization changed a number of names and gave Ferris an over-the-top pirate accent. It even gave the people involved with the fan translation a good laugh. It also had the dubious honor of being released on the heels of the highly anticipated Final Fantasy VIII in North America, and by this time, the fan patch had already been passed around countless times through chat rooms, news groups, and sketchy emulation sites. In the early 2000s, the rift between Square and Nintendo would heal, and Square would merge with its longtime rival Enix. Square Enix would go on to port their 16-bit Final Fantasy titles to the Game Boy Advance, as well as the first two entries in the series. Development of these titles was once again farmed out to Tosei, and FF5 would appear near the end of 2006. The game received new content such as a bonus dungeon and four new jobs. This dungeon featured even more challenging super bosses. It also received a brand new localization that was more polished than even the fan translation. The GBA port also fixed a number of bugs from the Super Famicom version like losing your airship if you landed in a certain spot. Reviews of this version were much kinder than the anthology release a few years prior. Once again, critics praised the game for its job system and improved localization. Nintendo Power gave the game high marks and even put out its own official strategy guide. The GBA port was released in a rather odd position outside Japan. It was sandwiched in between Final Fantasy XII on the PlayStation 2 and the remake of Final Fantasy III on the Nintendo DS. In 2013, the game was ported to iOS and Android devices by Matrix Software. These were the folks responsible for the 3D remakes of Final Fantasy III and IV on the DS. This was essentially a straight port of the GBA version, but with redone visuals. The character sprites were not very well received. The menus received a complete overhaul with touch controls in mind. In 2015, the game made its way onto Steam. This was a port of the mobile version with controller support, much like the other mobile ports. Interestingly enough, the announcement trailer refers to Bart's as butts here. 2021 saw the release of the Pixel Remaster on mobile platforms and Steam simultaneously. As a result, the other ports were taken down from their respective stores. The Pixel Remaster would fix the bugs found in earlier versions and update the visuals to be more in line with the original Super Famicom version. The aesthetic here was far less polarizing than the original mobile versions. But it wasn't just the visuals that received an overhaul. The soundtrack was also remixed, just like with the other Pixel remasters. However, the bonus content from later versions was omitted here. These Pixel remasters were meant to be recreations of the originals, but with updated graphics and quality of life features. In 2015, Tetsuya Nomura expressed interest in remaking Final Fantasy V and VI. Yoshinori Kitase also expressed interest in remaking FF5 back in 2020. Will this ever come to fruition? Only time will tell. When we come back, let's wrap it up with some final thoughts on Final Fantasy V. Final 
So what is it about Final Fantasy V that makes it so special? In a genre that lives and dies by its storytelling, people have been critical of this aspect of the game. People have often criticized it for being trite and trope-laden, and this is certainly true by today's standards. But don't forget, by the time Western fans had the chance to enjoy this game in their native tongue, they were already enjoying more sophisticated experiences like Final Fantasy VII, Xenogears, and Final Fantasy VIII. By 1992 standards, these ideas were still pretty fresh. On the surface, Final Fantasy V is your standard save the crystal, save the world story we've heard many times before and makes no effort to hide this. But you know what? Who cares? There's a certain beauty to that kind of unapologetic artistic sincerity. There's beauty and simplicity especially when it's well executed. For example, take this glass of whiskey. Perfectly fine on its own. But then you start adding ice, soda, juice even other spirits as people have done for generations. These additions give it further complexity and flavor that wasn't there previously. Over time, this more complex and nuanced cocktail might be your new favorite. But if you aren't careful, the whiskey is drowned out by the other additions and eventually becomes unrecognizable. But then, you take a sip of high quality whiskey all on its own, and you're like, hey, this isn't so bad by itself. Final Fantasy V is that whiskey. The unambiguous tale of heroes banding together for a common goal, struggling and sacrificing along the way, but ultimately prevailing in the end. It's a story we've heard a million times before, and one we've been telling since the dawn of human history. There's a reason these stories have been told for so long and across so many cultures. Regardless of where you're from, there's something inherently familiar and comforting about them. While the packaging may be different, it's a shared experience that we have with our great-grandparents or a complete stranger on the other side of the planet. While FF5 may not be the first to do what it did, it perfected the formula established by its predecessors in the early years of JRPGs. Underneath that simplistic veneer of four heroes versus evil tree wizard, there's a rich and rewarding gameplay experience. In fact, this is evidenced by what fans have done with the game over the years, such as the four job fiesta charity event held each summer. While games have evolved mechanically and thematically over the years, it's still nice to experience these older titles, not just for the sake of nostalgia. They harken back to simpler times and remind us of what brought us here in the first place. They also showcase just how bold and creative the games that came after them actually were. It's like that high quality whiskey. Sure, it's not as sexy as some of the cocktails that derive from it, but that's okay. Sometimes, experiencing the best version of a simple joy in its most basic form can help us appreciate the more complex things that derive from it. It goes back to an overarching theme of this channel. To better understand who we are and where we're going, we must first understand where we came from. These words ring true, be they in our world or one of fiction. So if you made it all the way here, comment with your favorite Final Fantasy V moments. As always, thank you so much for watching. And remember, to thine own self be true. Until next time, farewell.